A new prospect, welcome to RTB 2021 for January 16th. Hope you're doing well today. Uh, our texts for today are four. Once again, we have um, Matt, Genesis 17, Matthew 16, Nehemiah 6, and Acts 16. So let's talk about each one of these uh, in turn. Uh, so Genesis 17 is a, um, uh, a very significant story. Uh, in the story of Abraham. So if you're looking at a structure of the overall book of Genesis, you've got the patriarchal narratives, uh, the narratives discussing the, the events and the lives of the patriarchs of Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob, and of course, Joseph and the other 12, and the other uh, 11 brothers. Um, and those take up the, the chapters from chapter 12 through chapter 50. Well, Abraham is kind of the focus of chapters 12 through 25. And really all of those chapters are all focused on uh, God's covenant relationship with, with these patriarchs uh, and his promises to them. Uh, and the covenant relationship, of course, this deep bonded uh, relationship grounded in lo loyalty and love. Uh, Abraham is given by grace, uh, is solidified by that covenant ceremony that we talked about a few days ago in Genesis 15. And now in Genesis 17, you've got the covenant relationship being um, uh, God giving the, the sign of the covenant, um, which would be a symbol that uh, Israel was in covenant relationship with God. And that is, of course, uh, is, is the sign of circumcision, uh, which for Abraham would be a, a sign that would be connected to uh, the promise that was given to him of many uh, offspring, many seed. And uh, so this was a outward symbol of the fact that Israel and Abraham and his descendants are part of the, the people of God. Uh, later on, by the way, the prophets will talk about how uh, that outward symbol, yes, that's, that's fine and good, but what you really need, and really even Moses himself talks about this in the book of Deuteronomy, is circumcision of the heart. In other words, what should define us as the people of God is not outward circumcision, but actually uh, something that God has done uh, within us, giving us a new heart, um, uh, turning that heart of flesh, a heart of stone into a heart of flesh uh, as a people. That should be what defines us as the people of God. Uh, moving on to Nehemiah, uh, we have finally in Nehemiah chapter 6, the, um, the walls being completed, uh, and with, uh, with that, that's a significant moment, obviously, uh, it's to the chagrin of many in, uh, in the, uh, among the people who are surrounding uh, the Jewish people who had returned from exile, they were not all that happy about those walls being completed, but Nehemiah had completed them in the midst of all this opposition. One of the things that I think is a, an interesting thing to pay attention to as you read through Nehemiah is just how many times he says things like, for instance, uh, this is in... Um, see if I can find it again. Um, yeah, in verse 16, uh, all this work which had been accomplished with the help of the Lord. The other key phrase that you'll see a lot in the book of Nehemiah is the good hand of the Lord being upon uh, him, uh, Nehemiah himself, to accomplish certain things. So he has this view, Nehemiah does, of the sovereignty of God, God sovereignly overseeing the restoration of his people, because of course this is central to his plans and purposes of bringing about salvation to the entirety of the globe uh, to fulfill the promises given to Abraham that we've been reading about in Genesis. Uh, so we see these two books connected and the purposes of God being connected and God sovereignly fulfilling those purposes uh, through faithful individuals like Nehemiah. And he still does that today, right? He still fulfills his sovereign purposes uh, through using faithful uh, people uh, within his church today. Uh, moving on to, uh, let's move on up to Acts and we'll come back to, to Matthew. In Acts, uh, we have Acts 16, we have Paul uh, receiving what is known as his Macedonian call or Macedonian vision where he's, um, he is traveling along and uh, he has a, a vision from Macedonia to, uh, to bring the gospel there on the second missionary journey. Uh, and so go he does, and he uh, enters into uh, Europe for the really for the first time. Uh, and you have the first converts in Europe, including uh, people like Lydia uh, and the Philippian, um, and the Philippian jailer. 
Uh, so very significant moments in the life of the early church here. Uh, and then the, again, in the outworking of salvation history. But I wanted to spend a little bit of time on Matthew 16. This is a, a kind of a, a huge moment and a turning point in the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus, where Jesus is at Caesarea Philippi. In fact, preached on this, um, I, I can't remember how long ago. It's probably about a year ago now, uh, looking at uh, Jesus and his teaching on the church. Now, Jesus only mentions uh, the church twice in his gospels and the gospels, uh, this passage, and then in Matthew 18. Uh, in this text, this is where Jesus uh, is at Caesarea Philippi, that's a pagan city uh, and north of, of Galilee. And this is where he asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? Famously, they respond by saying, well, they say prophet, and all these other things. Uh, and then he says, who do you say that I am? Uh, and Peter responds famously, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and Jesus says, upon you, Peter, um, and upon this confession that you, you make, uh, I will build my church. And so uh, a couple of things to note about that. I always love that passage because, number one, it shows that Christ is building his church. Uh, and, it's, and it's built on the uh the the faithful uh um ministry of the apostles as embodied by peter uh and what they taught uh the gospel will continue to go forth the church will go forth and the gates of hell will not prevail against it uh that's always just an encouraging thing as we see uh the world around us is is in disarray but the church still goes forward uh, and the church is still being built by by jesus until he comes again. Uh, the other thing that I, that I love about this uh, text is, of course, the this the teaching on on discipleship that comes right after that. Uh, that of course Peter doesn't quite understand all of what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah because he doesn't like Jesus teaching him about um, about his his death and burial and resurrection. Uh, but then. Something that always happens in the Gospels uh, is that when Jesus identifies who he is and who he truly is, then he starts to teach about discipleship. And starting in verse 24, he talks about, um, if anyone wishes to come after me, but he must deny himself. In other words, if discipleship is becoming like the discipler, it's only natural that Jesus would say, this is who I am, and this is who you must be if you want to be like me. Uh, and so uh, this is a significant moment uh, of teaching uh, for disciples of Jesus. If you want to know what it means to be like Jesus, you need to be like Jesus in this way, uh, to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow, follow him. That's a good, I think, text to, to kind of chew on and meditate on for the rest of the day in verse 24 of Matthew 16. So hope you've enjoyed this, uh, this little discussion of Matthew 16. It's a uh, and all these texts are, are, are wonderful little texts. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day.